Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. Welcome back to Basketball History 101. This is Rick Loiza, and with me in studio is editor and producer Jacob Loiza. Hey, Jacob. Hey, Dad. How are you doing? Doing well today. Um, so today we're going to talk about rules changes from the early part of basketball history. That's right. So I'm wondering if the rules were changed that they're better now the way they are currently, then why should we care about what they used to be where they, were, they weren't as quite as good? Well, what I wanted to do with this episode is to show the audience what basketball really used to be like in the early days. So to show them what the problem was that they were trying to fix. Each of these rules changes was attempting to fix a problem. And so it gives us a way to talk about what that problem was and then why that rule was changed in order to make the game better. Right. So what were some of these changes? Well, obviously, we're going to get into it during the episode, but one is about the introduction of dribbling to the game. Another one had to do with the out-of-bounds, which team gets to throw the ball back in during an out-of-bounds play, and even the the distance of the free throw line from the basket. So that, that's just a couple of the ones we're going to go through. Cool. Now, this is just covering the first 50 years of basketball and the rule changes that were made during that time period. Do you think you're going to go on to make this like a mini-series where you talk about different time periods and the rule changes? Yeah, I think I will do one or two more episodes somewhere down the line where then we'll take the next 50 years. So this will be probably from around the 1940s through the 1990s, somewhere there, capture some of the rules changes there. And then maybe a third episode way down the line where we'll talk about some of the different changes over the last 25 years. Cool. Well, should we get into the episode now? Sure, let's get started. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101. I am your host, Rick Loiza, and this is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today, we're going to talk about some of the early rules changes to the game of basketball. For today's episode, we're going to focus specifically on some of the big rules changes that occurred during the first 50 years of the game's development. The game of basketball is always undergoing changes. The rules of the game are constantly being reviewed to see if any adjustments need to be made to keep the game exciting. One of the things that I really appreciate about the people involved with the game's development is that, for the most part, their primary concern was keeping the game exciting and enjoyable to watch. Because, after all, that's how you sell tickets and make money, is by keeping the game exciting. In other words, They wanted it to be as fun as possible. That has been the guiding principle for many of the rules changes that we will talk about today. So let's just get right into it. The game was invented in 1891. And if you want to hear more about that specific story, go all the way back to episode one of this podcast, where I talk about the invention of the game and the very first game ever played. So for today, I'm going to talk about these rules changes in chronological order of when they were made. The first significant rule change came in 1893, just two years after the game was invented. The rule change allowed for the player holding the ball to pivot on one foot as long as that foot stayed anchored in its position. You see, the original 13 rules of basketball said that a player could not run with the ball. So most players interpreted this to mean that both feet had to stay positioned in their spot. 
but it didn't take long for players to begin to pivot on one foot since that didn't seem to constitute running with the ball. Well, some players liked to pivot on one foot while others thought that it was breaking the spirit of the rule if not the actual wording of the rule. It's like some guys were, hey, you can't do that. And the other guys were like, yes, I can. No, you can't. Yes, I can. So the powers that be got together and collectively decided that having a pivot foot was perfectly acceptable and did not constitute a travel violation. And this was a great clarification of the original rule. You can see today just how being able to pivot on one foot allows the player with the ball just enough movement to get a clean pass away or even a clean shot. The next rule change came in 1895. The rule added a backboard as a standard piece of equipment on all baskets. Prior to this, baskets were simply attached to a pole or to a railing without anything even resembling a backboard. In many games where the basket was attached to a railing, you often had fans leaning over the railing and interfering with the shot. So, let's say you're a fan of the home team and the visiting team is taking a shot. Well, if you're sitting close enough to the basket, you can just stick your hand out and easily block the shot or shake the basket or basically just do anything to keep the ball from going in against your team. And fans did this all the time. This was home court advantage taken to a whole new level. Fan interference was happening with such regularity that a backboard was created to prevent fans from sticking their hands in the way. And there was also another rule change in 1895 that was also significant. It was decided to move the free throw line from 20 feet back to just 15 feet back like it is today. So imagine taking your free throws from the top of the key. That's about 20 feet away from the basket. And that was an incentive to foul like crazy. At 20 feet away, making a free throw was difficult. So as a defense, you were better off sending the other team to the free throw line than letting them take an open shot. After all, you're just playing the percentages. And the percentages said, send them to the free throw line. But by bringing the free throw line five feet closer, it made the free throw easier to make, which would help deter the opponent from fouling you on every possession. You see, that's the problem they were trying to solve. With the free throw line so far away, you were better off just fouling the other team every chance you had. And then it became a free throw contest. And nobody wants to watch a free throw contest. But now, the defense had to think about it. Sending them to the free throw line may not be your best move. The percentages were now leaning the other way. You might be better off just playing good defense and taking your chances that the shot's going to miss. And that helped keep the game moving. And that made for more exciting basketball to watch. Now let's move on to the next one. The next significant rule change happened in 1896. The value of the shots were changed. For a very brief period of time, both regular field goals and free throws were all worth three points. Of course, you only got one free throw back then on a foul, not, not two shots like today. So don't start thinking that there were some six point trips to the line. So if you got fouled while shooting, you took one free throw to try to get your three points. And there was no and one back then. If you were fouled, but still made the shot, then that was it. Other team gets the ball, let's go. But that was the year that they decided that field goals were going to be worth two points and free throws were going to be worth only one. And that's where we have it today, of course. There's been no changes to the value of these shots until the modern three-point line was created in the 1970s. Now, in my research, I could not find why baskets were worth three points in the first place. It really doesn't make any sense from what I could find. And it wasn't happening everywhere, it was only in some places that they had this rule of three points for a basket. So by making this rule change, it made it uniform around the country and everybody is now playing by the same rules. Two points for a field goal, one point for a free throw, and that's it. Our next rule change is a really big one, and this one came in 1897. The Yale University basketball team started dribbling the ball. 
And that wouldn't seem like a big deal today, except dribbling was not part of the original game. It was never intended for players to be able to dribble the ball. Up until that time, you would pass the ball around, but you wouldn't actually bounce it because that was not the intention of the inventor. However, the coach at Yale University was like, hey guys, I think I found a way to exploit the rules. See, he used a tactic of dribbling as a way of taking advantage of a loophole. The rules simply said that you could not run while carrying the ball. Well, if you're dribbling, you are technically not carrying the ball. Therefore, you could move around as long as you were bouncing the ball as you moved. Now, this required a major meeting of the influential people of the day. Should dribbling be allowed to continue, or should they close the loophole in the rules and disallow this new technique? Thankfully, they were very forward-looking and realized how exciting the game would become if they allowed dribbling to continue. However, it was still considered a risky technique because the defender could easily poke his hand in and get the ball away from you. It was the basketball equivalent of watching a guy riding a unicycle while juggling chainsaws. This was considered very flashy, very risky, but also very exciting. There was a huge wow factor and fans loved seeing players dribble. Now, another thing that did make this kind of risky is that the basketballs back then had laces that protruded from the ball the way that the laces protrude on an American football. Imagine dribbling a basketball that had football style laces. You always had to be aware of where the laces are. You don't want the ball to hit the ground on the laces or else it could easily bounce away from you. So when guys did dribble, they used it minimally. They only dribbled far enough to make the pass or to take the shot. You would never see a guy pulling a James Harden and just dribbling it a thousand times and then taking a step back jumper. Nobody did that back then. So this was a really great rule change that forever changed how the game is played and it opened things up to start developing plays with movement from the dribbler as well as movement from the other four players. Now let's go on to 1910 and this was the introduction of a glass backboard. Now this was a very simple problem to fix. With the original backboards the fans sitting behind the basket had a hard time seeing the game. So with a glass backboard, they now could see. It was a problem that needed to be dealt with. It was a very easy solution. Not a whole lot of discussion on this one. I mean, just put the glass backboard and you're done. So we're good to go there. And that's actually a good place to take a pause. And we'll keep talking about other rule changes right after this break. Welcome back. Now let's keep going with the rules changes. In 1914, another big rule change came into existence. The out-of-bounds rule was changed so that the opposite team of the one who touched the ball last automatically gets the ball. Now, today, everyone at every level of basketball knows this one. I happen to coach 7- and 8-year-old boys in a youth basketball league, and I don't even have to explain this one to them. They already understand it. If you touch the ball last before it goes out of bounds, the other team automatically gets the ball. It's that simple. Everybody just gets this. So you're probably wondering, well, what were they doing before this rule was put in place? <laughs> well, here's what they did. If the ball went out of bounds, the first player who could get to the ball got to keep possession. So when a ball went out of bounds, it became this insane scramble for the ball. Players were shoving and falling all over each other to be the first to grab the ball and get it in bounds. It looked like a fumble in American football. Once you claim possession, you could throw the ball into a teammate. This was the reason that players used to wear all kinds of pads back then. If you ever look at really old photos of basketball players, they are often wearing knee pads and sometimes elbow pads. And that's because the game was really, really rough in this type of situation. I mean, could you imagine watching NBA basketball back in the 1980s and having Charles Oakley and Bill A. Beer both racing to get to the ball first on an out of bounds? you'd be creating a situation where you're just asking for fights to happen. Basketball was a really rough game back then, so this rule change was definitely necessary 
and it significantly reduced the number of injuries that occurred from trying to be the first one to get an out-of-bounds ball. And reducing injuries is good for the game. Nobody wants to see a superstar get injured then have to miss a long stretch of time with your team. This is a good change for sure. In 1924, they changed the rule so that any violation doesn't always result in a free throw. You see, prior to 1924, any foul or violation resulted in a free throw for the other team. So if you traveled with the ball, the other team got to shoot free throws. If you double dribbled, the other team got to shoot free throws. If you stepped over the line on an inbounds pass, the other team got to shoot free throws. So the game had to make a distinction between what is actually a contact foul, like pushing a player, bumping the shooter while he's shooting, and other things like traveling or stepping over the line on an inbounds play. So once they made that distinction, there were free throws only for contact and other type of fouls of that nature. Any non-contact violation was just a turnover and let's keep the game moving. Women play basketball all over the world and the popularity continues to grow. So that's it for today. Join us next time as we continue with the NBA nickname series. We will cover the Southeast Division, which includes the Miami Heat, the Orlando Magic, the Atlanta Hawks, the Charlotte Hornets, and the Washington Wizards. That's next time on Basketball History 101. If you like what you hear, please hit that subscribe button wherever you get your podcasts. And check out our page on Facebook. It's called Basketball History 101 Podcast. There you will find shorter historical posts as well as comments and discussion starters on today's game. I'll also announce there when new episodes come out. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us each week as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.